Hey everybody, welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about cell parts. It's pretty much a review of the things we covered in sixth grade, but I need to make sure you know these basic cell parts and their functions before we can move on and talk about more. So let's get started. Let's start with the, the parts of the animal cell. So we're on the front side of your notes where it says cell part notes. Remember these parts are called organelles. Organelles mean tiny organs. These are the parts of the animal cell, so we'll start with those first. The animal cell's outer covering is called a cell membrane. The membrane covers the cell and it's semi-permeable. Semi-permeable is a fancy way of saying it allows some things in and it keeps other things out. Think of it as like a security fence. So air can move through a fence, but it keeps things out that you don't want in and it keeps things in that you don't want to get out. So it's semi-permeable. If the membrane doesn't or can't do its job, the cell could explode. Watch what happens in this short video clip when the cell membrane doesn't do its job. The job of the cell membrane is to keep things in, some things in the cell and keep some things out of the cell. One of the things the cell can't take on too much of is water. If a cell takes on too much water, it overinflates like a water balloon that's been overfilled. Let's see what happens. This is your obligatory explosion clip for the video. Check out these cells exploding. Too much water filling the cell. It's starting to burst. That's what happens to the cells when they overinflate. The cell membrane doesn't keep out what needs to be out, and the cell overfills like a water balloon. Next, let's talk about the cytoplasm. So speaking of fluid inside the cell, there's already supposed to be fluid inside the cell. We call this cytoplasm. Cytoplasm is just a clear jelly-like substance that holds all of those organelles inside the cell and kind of keeps them in position. Remember what does organelles mean again? Tiny organs. So they're the tiny parts that make up the cell. All of these parts we're talking about are called organelles. Cytoplasm is the fluid that holds it all together. Next, we're going to talk about the small vacuole, which is also going to be called lysosomes inside of an animal cell. So you're going to hear those words interchangeably depending on the resource we are using. You'll hear small vacuole. You will also hear lysosomes. A lysosome's job is to store food, water, and waste. So they could be looked at as like small storage rooms inside of the cell. In some cases, they can be like little garbage containers. So that is their job within an animal cell. Their job is to store things, just depending on what the lysosome is. Ribosomes are extremely important to our cells. Ribosomes are like little factories. They are where the protein is made, where proteins are assembled and put together. The job of the ribosomes is to read the code of your DNA and then actually build the proteins that make you you. Somewhere in your DNA there's a code to tell you what color your eyes will be. The ribosomes are what build the proteins to give your eyes their actual color. It's pretty fascinating. Ah, uh, the Golgi complex, everybody's favorite word to say, Golgi complex. You will also see this word as pronounced the Golgi bodies and sometimes the Golgi apparatus, depending on what resource we are using. Golgi complex, think of it as like the UPS man. The UPS person packages and transports materials out of the cell. So these little bubbles get filled with whatever needs to be transported out of the cell. Maybe it's a product the cell's made, maybe it's waste. So they get packaged up and put into these little bubbles and the little bubbles float outside to the cell membrane where they are exited out of the cell. Next up, we have the mighty mitochondria. The mighty mitochondria's whole job is to break down sugars to make energy. So let's see some more detail about how this works. Our bodies need energy to move, to eat, to breathe. The chemical energy in the human body is produced in a part of the cell called the mitochondria. 
Mitochondria convert the food you eat in the form of organic molecules into chemical energies that can be used by the cell, called ATP. ATP is the fuel of the human body. The process of converting organic nutrients that you eat into ATP is called cellular respiration. As the agents that create energy for you, mitochondria are incredibly important to the functioning of the human body. Cells that require more energy contain more mitochondria. Muscle cells use a lot of ATP for muscle contraction. In order to produce the amount of ATP that's required, there are more mitochondria found in muscle cells. Inside mitochondria, there are two membranes, an outer membrane and an inner membrane. The double membrane structure of mitochondria is really important to the process of cellular respiration because it allows mitochondria to sort molecules that it uses for chemical processes. Scientists think that mitochondria evolved from bacteria and used to be a separate single-celled organism. The reason for this theory is that mitochondria contain their own genetic information. Eventually, mitochondria were incorporated into the cell of another organism, and from then on, mitochondria have lived on inside their host cells, manufacturing energy for other organisms. When you breathe, you're bringing oxygen into your body that mitochondria use during cellular respiration. Cellular respiration that uses oxygen is called aerobic. In a way, every breath you take is supporting an ancient life form that now resides inside your cells. It isn't a one-way relationship, though. Mitochondria use the oxygen you breathe to make energy for you. All right, so let's break this down. We just saw a very complicated process called cellular respiration. This process takes place in the mitochondria that we just saw. The mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, where the cell makes a form of chemical energy called ATP. ATP is short for adenosine triphosphate. We'll talk about more of that later. So here is the equation that you need to write down, the chemical equation for cellular respiration. First, we need C6H12O6. That is a very fancy way of saying glucose. So where do you get glucose from? Well, the food you eat, perhaps a tasty cheese log. When you eat glucose and you breathe in oxygen, which is O2, as we should know from chemistry, our body takes that glucose and our body takes that oxygen and it goes into the mitochondria of your cells, where the mitochondria rearranges all of those molecules to make something new. Remember energy and matter are not created or destroyed, it just changes forms. We're taking that chemical energy and we're storing it in our bodies and we're changing it to a new form of energy. We're taking those molecules and rearranging them to make something new. We're making carbon dioxide, water, and that very important energy, ATP, to do all of your body's functions. It's like staying awake in science class during a sweet video. Next, the nucleus. The nucleus contains the cell's DNA, which is the genetic information in the form of chromosomes. We'll talk about chromosomes later. It's just a particular shape the DNA takes during certain stages of cell division. It also serves as the control center. We think of the nucleus as like the boss of the cell, telling all the other things what to do, because that's what the DNA is. It's all the instructions for how your body is to function, even at the cellular level. So let's look a little bit more closely. Inside eukaryotic cells, which are complex cells that have organelles, genetic information is stored in a structure called the nucleus, known as the control center of the cell. The nucleus is contained by a double membrane called the nuclear envelope, which works to protect the DNA by controlling what types of molecules can enter or exit. The nuclear envelope uses pores that allow certain substances to enter and leave. Inside the nucleus is an area called the nucleolus. The nucleolus plays an important role in turning genetic information into reality. All right, we'll go ahead and stop there. We'll get more in depth into the nucleus and how DNA works in our next chapter. All right, why don't you press pause, take a breather, because we've learned everything we need to know about the animal cell for now. And now we're going to move on into the plant cell. 
the three parts we're about to discuss now on the back of your notes are parts that are unique to the plant cell. That means they're found only in a plant cell. The plant still has the plant cell still has all the other parts we've already seen, but these are three additional parts. So in addition to those other things we've seen, these are some things that plant cells have. Well, think about it. What's something a plant can do that you can't? Ah, it can make its own food. So let's talk about some of those structures that make that possible. Let's start with the cell wall. The job of the cell wall is to provide strength and support to the cell membrane. Remember, the membrane is like a security fence, so the cell wall is like a security wall where nothing can get through unless you open up some sort of gate. The cell wall provides strength and support to the cell membrane. Random cool fact, have you ever touched straw? That's what you're feeling. It's that tough outer covering are the dried up cell walls of all the cells. Next, let's look at the large vacuole. The large vacuole is a storage container for water and other liquids. It is a very, very large storage container because plants need a lot of water. In fact, it's like a big balloon inside of the cell where if that balloon inflates and deflates, that's what makes a plant thrive or wilt like you see in this illustration here. The plant wilts because literally the balloon inside full of water has deflated and the plant shrivels up. So as the water inside the cell is depleted, you can see the plant look like it gets sad. Last but certainly not least is the chloroplast. The chloroplast is where photosynthesis happens. Photosynthesis is that process of how plants take water, air, and sunlight and turn it into food that is usable by plants and food for us to eat. Plants have chloroplasts, which are full of that green coloring called chlorophyll. And we'll look at a little, that in a little bit more detail in just a few minutes. Chlorophyll captures the energy from sunlight. So it takes sun energy and converts it into chemical energy. Remember, energy isn't created or destroyed. It changes forms. And this chloroplast is the magic place where that energy changes forms. So now let's check out this awesome Amoeba Sisters video clip to see and write the equation for photosynthesis and see how the process works. Here is the formula, Here is the formula for photosynthesis. On the left side of the formula, you will find the reactants. That means these are the inputs. The plant has to have these in order to do photosynthesis. On the right side of the formula, you will see the products. That means those are the items that are produced by the plant, the outputs. Now, sometimes the formula is written a little differently. Technically, it needs to be balanced, and sometimes light is written on top of the arrow just to show that it's in the presence of light, so it may instead look like this. The C6H12O6 that product, it's a sugar, specifically glucose. Now, photosynthesis, it's not just a formula. Have you ever tried to capture light before? It's hard. Plants have light capturing molecules called pigments that help them do this. See, visible light, it has different wavelengths. Different wavelengths of light have different colors. If you have ever played with a prism before, you may have been able to see how light can be divided up into a rainbow of colors due to these different wavelengths. Well, one pigment that plants use for photosynthesis is called chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is an expert at absorbing red and blue light, but not so much green light. Because it does not absorb very much green light, it actually reflects green light. Therefore, many plants appear green to our eyes. There are more pigments besides chlorophyll that work with different wavelengths of light, and this can explain why green is not the only color that you see in plants. All right, true story. Awesome facts there. So, there's the photosynthesis chemical equation. But didn't you notice something really similar between photosynthesis and cellular respiration? The processes are related! Dun-dun-dun! Mind blown. 
the products that are made from photosynthesis are oxygen and glucose, as we just learned. So it makes glucose, that sugar, and oxygen we need to breathe. So then an animal like us, or even like a caterpillar, takes in the glucose and breathes in oxygen. Then we breathe out carbon dioxide and water vapor. Those are exactly the reactants that photosynthesis needs to take place. So these processes are directly related. Well, thanks for listening. I hope you had a great notes experience and please have them ready by the due date so that we can move on and continue our learning.